Uh, so let me introduce the, the last speaker, and thank you all for staying for the last speaker. That's very nice. <laughs> Holland Robbins, who comes from the Hutchison uh, Cancer Center, and he's going to tell us about uh, direct assessment of TCR diversity and frequency. Thanks. All right. Um, I know a lot of people have to leave at 5.30, so I will make sure that I'm done by then. Um, so we've uh, heard a lot of, about uh, cancer systems biology in various talks today, and um, essentially there's, we've, we've probably gone through the whole set of different um, types of measurements that are involved in, in, in the system to the extent that, that we're able to, to make these measurements at this point. However, um, the immune system has been sort of left out of this in a lot of ways. And part of the reason is that um, the, if you look at, say, um, genotypes, or let's, let's start with microarray data. If you're looking at microarray data, you're, you might have 50,000 different um, genes that you're looking at, or, or 30,000 different genes on, on, um, on your um, array. However, each person has those same 30,000 different uh, genes on the array. The immune system um, does something very different, which is, that, which is that the T cells and B cells, which make up your adaptive immune system, they are predicted to come in 10, 5 times 10 to the 18th, T cells alone, 5 to 10 times 18th different forms, and that's just an absolutely massive number that really can't be measured, okay, and by any, any technology that we have. So, and not only that, there's supposed to be such a huge variation between people that actually studying the difference between someone's T cell repertoire in one person versus another would seem relatively fruitless. However, um, I'm going to show you that, that um, that's not exactly true, and what I'd like to do is, I'm not actually going to be able to tell you much about how this applies to cancer right now, but what I'd like to do, and if you remember um, Annalisa's um, cloud picture with the bubbles, and they had metabolomics and proteomics and, and genotypes and everything else, I'd like to add an extra bubble, and that bubble would be um, your adaptive immune repertoire, okay? Now, but in order to do that, I first need to show you that that's a relevant measurement to do. And in order to do that, I need to show you that between any given people, there actually is commonality in our adaptive immune system, so that measuring one person and measuring another is, is a, it tells you, measuring one can tell you something about another and therefore tell you something about um, the uh, correlated with different forms of cancer. Okay. We already know that the adaptive immune system plays a huge role in cancer. It does it in, in three different ways that, that I can think of. And first is that first is a relatively indirect role in controlling viruses which have a strong rate of, of, of causing cancer. We know this if you, if you have a kidney transplant and you're on immunosuppressive drugs, your rate of getting uh, certain types of skin cancer goes up a hundredfold. So it's, I mean, it's clear in many, many examples that, that that the adaptive immune system is, is directly suppressing sets of viruses that cause cancer. So that's number one. Number two is that it's fairly well known um, in, in uh, cancer immunology groups that, that cancer um, is actually controlled. Cancer expresses aberrant um, uh, proteins, and those are seen by an attack by our adaptive immune system. And so there's a direct control of cancer by our adaptive immune system. And then the third is, in, in sort of a practical way, is how do we use that information? Um, and that it's being used in, in the idea of both um, cancer vaccines and immunotherapy, which is that um, you, you actually harvest these T cells that are known to attack tumors, and you grow them up in a certain way and put them back in a person. And in certain cases, they've shown really strong efficacy in actually destroying the tumor. And we're involved in a couple of different projects like that, um, but they're not at the point where I can tell you about them. So I'll just hopefully, what I'd like to do right now is, is convince you that, that T cell receptor repertoires belong as another bubble um, and should be added in the future to when you do cancer systems biology, this should be another set of measurements that has strong potential. 
um, to, to give us uh, viable information. In particular, one of the pieces of information that, that we're looking at is the idea that we can use the immune repo uh, repertoire as a biomarker to determine either what stage of cancer someone has or whether or not someone actually has cancer. Okay, so just a quick rundown on what um, I'm gonna be studying, um, telling you about T cells in particular. So there's two types. Your, your adaptive immune system has the difficult job of, its, its job is to recognize and, and, and rid the body of a set of, uh, unknown set of uh, foreign pathogens that you've never been exposed to before. So its strategy to do this is that it creates a, a set of millions of pseudo-random receptors, puts them on the surface of different cells, at, in either T cells or B cells, and when it sees the appropriate antigen, so basically these, cell, these receptors are supposed to cover what you'd call shape space. So any shape that comes in, one of these is going to be sufficiently good a binder to it that it can um, recognize and, and stick to, to its target, its pathogen, then the, uh, it starts off a cascade where you have three processes. One is that the, they clonally expand. The, the particular cell that has the right receptor for that pathogen clonally expands um, and creates an army. There's a change in phenotype where for T cells, they become killers and they kill the, the actual infected cells. And the third thing they do is they form immunological memory so that you have a standing army waiting in case you get that virus again. Okay or pathogen. And the, the adaptive immune system has two parts. It has um, B cells and T cells. The B cells, our job is to recognize particles that are um, basically floating in your system. And T cells are, have the job of recognizing when a cell has been infected, an intracellular pathogen. And that happens by the cell as a mechanism for chopping up um, fractions of every bit of proteins produced and presents them on the surface with these HLA markers, with the HLA molecules. And T cells, so just, does this thing work? Um, so this is the HLA, and this is a little piece of that protein that was in the cell that's presented. And T cells come and bind to this thing, okay? And then that's where the cascade starts, and some of them turn into killer T cells and kill the cell down here that's infected. Um, and this little part up here with the, with the colors is called uh, the CDR3 region, and that's the region that's the variable region that has all the different shapes, okay? Um, and so how are these things made? Well, they're made, they're, they're a heterodimer. They basically form a Y-shaped receptor with an alpha chain and a beta chain. This is the most common type of T cell. Um, and basically, unlike every other cell in your body, if, if I took a liver cell and a kidney cell from your, from your body and compared the DNA, they would be almost identical. For, immune, uh, for the adaptive immune cells, if I look everywhere in your genome, there would be the same except for one region, and that region is the T cell receptor region, where the DNA itself actually rearranges. And what happens is you cut out one, it's called a segment, of one of 54 different Vs, one of two different Ds, and one of 13 different Js, and you stick them next to each other. So you get some combinatorial diversity by picking one of these different sets, okay? But it's not that much diversity. It's only um, on the order of five or 600. Um, however, at the junctions where you put between the V and the D, you delete back a little bit of the V, some of the D, and some of the J, and then there's another protein called TDT, which randomly inserts nucleotides in the middle. So you're really making a pseudo-random receptor. Now that's massive diversity, because each new, each new insertion you put in, you get this exponential blow up in diversity. You get a power of four each time, okay? Um, most of the diversity is in, is in the betas, and the reason is the betas rearrange first. Then when you have a functional beta, for each beta, it's predicted that about 20 different alphas are made. So you make on the order of um, between five and 10 million of these guys, and then add another, um, another factor of uh, 20 for, for each, okay? All right, so the idea is, how do you, what do you do with this? Well, you kind of, we need to sort of pick out a needle in a haystack. What we want to know is what is this sequence down here in the, the VDJ region? 
Well, this is only on average, you know, somewhere on the order of you know, 13 to 15 nucleotides long. Well, you're, you're, the human genome is 3 billion nucleotides long. So we have to pick out these 13 out of the 3 billion. And not only that, we need to know what V we had and what J we had. So we designed a strategy where we, we um, anchored, uh, used PCR to PCR up th this particular region. So we had to design specific primers to um, bind and then, and then sequence through this particular region, leaving enough J and enough V to be able to recognize which one we had. And we wanted to do this in a, in a very tight region so that we could use the super high throughput tech sequencing technology and look at lots of them quantitatively at the same time. Okay, so let me just give you a scale of the problem that we started with. Well, the problem is, is, that, is that the dogma in the field was, and this is based on a theoretical um, prediction, which is that, that of these different betas, that there was about five times 10 to the 11th possible betas, okay? that could be created, which led to five times 10 to the 18th total predicted T cells um, in the population. And this was done on some model, and this has sort of been the standard in the field for a very long time. Well, you only have, in, in a normal human, you have about 10 to the 12th total T cells in your blood. So if you're taking 10 to the 12th out of a pool of 10 to the 18th, and you look at two different people, they should, less than one in a million should be the same between those two people. So you should have almost no overlap in, in, two people should have no overlapping sequences, okay? Um, so is this really true? So w if this is true, then this wouldn't be very useful in terms of systems, um, cancer systems biology. Um, I wouldn't be talking about this if it was true, so I'm going to tell you it's not true, obviously. Um, so what we did is we just took seven different people. Uh, the reason seven is because we were using a, the Illumina sequencing technology, and it has eight lanes, and one of them is a control, leaving seven. I mean, we carefully designed this experiment, knowing power calculations. And, um, anyways, uh, so two were HLA identical sisters. We took their mother, and we took four unrelated um, people of very different ethnicities, which I'll show you in a second. The reason we had the two HLA identical sisters is that we wanted to just rule out what role HLA was playing to make sure that this wasn't... Um, uh, we don't know if it scaled up where HLA was playing a role that would change our results by a factor of 10 or 100, or if it just didn't make much of a difference. And what we did is then we looked at cell populations that were both naive and memory, as defined by surface markers. Okay, so here's the actual chart of who these people were. Here's their age distribution. There's a mix of males and females. The three, these two, one and three are the sisters. Two is their mother, and the rest have extremely diverse ethnicities. We have J uh, Japanese, Indian, and two uh, African, um, and a huge difference in HLA types. Um, and in our, so this is just what the raw data looks like. If you look at the, um, in the naive compartment, we were getting, you know, b about between five and six and a half, five and seven million reads, um, a T cell receptor reads per sample. Um, we now get closer to 20. The technology improves, you know, every six months, it more than doubles. Um, and this was done six months ago. Um, and of those, they fell into this number of unique um, sequences. Okay? So, you know, as I was saying, we predicted that there's maybe uh, 5 million different um, T-cell types in, in your blood, and we do that... At, um, with a set of formulas that, that I'm not going to present today. But, and so we're getting, um, you know, maybe a tenth or, or something like that of the total sequences in your blood. But remember, we're also getting all the big ones, right? Anything that the rare ones are the runs we're missing, okay? And that's going to be important because if you're going to share T cells between any two people, it's going to be the common ones that are going to be relevant for us, okay? All right, so let's just look at the distribution. So first question is, if you, I plotted the V versus J, just as a, a, a two-dimensional histogram, and we or ordered this for um, just according to its use, and what we realized is that they're not used evenly at all. And this has error bars on it, even though they're really hard to see, and the reason they're hard to see is that, is that there's not much variation. So the interesting thing is, is that the VJ combinations that aren't used very much are not used very much in anybody, and the ones that are used a lot are used a lot in everybody. Um, and 
The other interesting thing is that if you go over to memory, you actually get some significant differences, which really means that you know, this V here, this J is J26, this blue one. It doesn't, it's pretty rare in, in, in the naive compartment, but it blows up in the memory. And what that means is that there's probably some set of common, some common pathogen or set of common pathogens that um, have a preference for things how, uh, with J26. Okay, because they're blowing up much more, relatively speaking. All right, so um, our, our sort of breakthrough on this came when we organized um, our distribution of sequences by um, number of insertions. Now, remember I told you that the diversity was ma mainly driven by this number of insertions. And the reason is, is that your combinatorial diversity isn't that high because you had 54 times 13 times 2. That's all you get, whereas if you and your, the number of um, the diversity you get from deletions isn't that high either because you can only delete the nucleotide that's there. Whereas when you put a new one in, an insertion, you get four different choices. So if you delete five nucleotides, there's one way to do that. If you insert five nucleotides, there's four to the fifth power ways to do that. So this is really driving the, the, the diversity. And the models are based, that model where I said we had 10 to the 18th total T cells, or 10 to the 11th beta chains, it was based on having 12 insertions in the, in the uh, T cell receptor beta chain. Well, what we just noticed, just no one really had the data to see if that was right. So we just looked at it, and we, here's a cumulative distribution plot. What this tells us is that 90% of the sequences, T cells in any given person's blood, is has less than 12 insertions. So that's just a way overestimate. In fact, there are sequences way down here, even with two insertions, 10% or 15% of people of your sequences in your blood have two or less insertions. So the diversity of sequences with two or less insertions is just way, way smaller than, than something way up here. So the point is, is that even though our chances of sharing, any two people sharing sequences with, with uh, 12 insertions is almost zero, it's pretty good when you start looking at um, sequences with one or two insertions. And remember, we had, you know, we have um, 10 to the uh, 12 cells in our blood, so we have a lot of these sequences, even though it's 10%. That's 10% of 10 to the 12th is, is a very, very large number of sequences. And memory tracks about the same. Okay, so we just explicitly computed how many different ways you could make sequences with with 0, 1, 2, et cetera, insertions. And you find with low numbers of insertions, you get, you know, let's say, um, a million, or, or for, with 0, you get, you get 200,000. So here you're talking 10 to the 6th, which is very different than, than 5 times 10 to the 11th, which is what was predicted. OK, so what do we expect the overlap to be? Well, since we don't have that much time, and you probably, I don't know, probably not a huge math audience, if I had to guess. I'll just go quickly through this. We just, we just estimated what, what this distribution and this distribution together would give us for a predicted number of overlaps between any two people. And it gave us, if we use the original method of with the um, ten, 5 times 10 to the 11th beta sequences, we get you know, an estimate of about 20 or something like that. Now, if we use our, what, the actual data, we're getting like 15,000. That's 15,000 identically shared T cell receptor sequence beta chains between any two people. So now, as I said, we have the data so we can see if this is right. And so here it is. So here's this axis is the naive. So we go up here and we see, well, this is the distribution. And you know, the average is um, almost exactly that. It's, about, it's a little over 14,000. So our, our sort of hypothesis seems to be proving right here, which is that we really do have a large overlap between any set of people, any two people. Um, and here are the, the HLA identical sisters and their mother. Um, sorry, other way around. These are the sisters, and this is with one sister and the mother and the other sister and the mother. And they're a little bit higher, so it's playing some role, but it's not. We were thinking it could be way up here, but it's, it's not. So that was, you know, obviously we need to do more um, people to, to get some hard and fast rule on whether or not HLA is playing a role, but, but this at least tells us they're not off scale is what we were worried about. Okay, so then let's ask. What, this, well, this should suggest that these overlapping sequences have different numbers of insertions, so we can just check that. So 
the red is, is the overlapping sequences, and the bluish purpley thing is the non-overlapping sequences. And we just plot a number of insertions, and we find a significant, obvious difference between the um, overlapping guys and the non-overlapping guys. So it's exactly these. So so far, this model seems to be you know working out exactly as 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 it as it should. Okay. So one thing that um, we've so I should stop and say for a second that this really means that that um, T cells now become T cell receptor sequences become viable viable um, you know sort of uh, bubbles to put for 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 doing systems biology and in particular for doing diagnostics, which is that there's a large number of shared T cell receptors, so that if a subset correlates with a particular disease. It, it can be used throughout the population as a biomarker. And I'll show you an example of that in one second. Um, but right before we got that, this is something that we can also learn um, specific things about development. And um, of, so basically, what, when, you're, when your T cell develops, it rearranges, as I said, that, that um, uh, VDJ combination and expresses a receptor. Well, it does this in the thymus. The reason it's called a T cell is because of thymus. Um, and B cell is bone, bone marrow. Um, and so since it develops in the thymus, the first thing you have to do when you create this T cell receptor is it, it goes through a set of positive and negative selection in the thymus. The, the positive selection is to make sure that it has some affinity to bind to the type of things that are presented by cells in your system, because if it doesn't bind to anything even related to what could possibly be presented, it's just useless. And then more importantly, I think, is the negative selection, which is that if it binds super strongly to something that's normally expressed in your body, like if it binds to an HLA-presented part of actin or something, you're going to be in big trouble because you're going to have an autoimmune disease. Your immune system is going to attack your own, your own um, tissue. So part of that, however, one thing that um, I should say stupidly, it took me about six months to, to figure out because we just were throwing this data out, which is that... Sometimes when a T cell rearranges, um, it, most of the time when a T cell rearranges, since it has variable numbers of insertions and deletions, it's actually out of frame. So two-thirds of the time it's just out of frame. And then another fraction of the time it has a stop code on it. So what happens when that happens? Well, um, oftentimes the other allele, which we've been hearing a lot about today, the other allele rearranges. So in some subset of cells, sometimes the cell just dies, but in, the, in some fraction of cells, we have both, uh, uh, two alleles both rearranged, one, one totally dysfunctional and one, one that's the productive one that's the, the viable T cell. Well, we can compare the difference between the out-of-frame guys and the in-frame guys, the productive ones, and this should tell us a lot about the process of, of um, selection inside the thymus. Um, so, for instance... If we look here, this is um, the in-frame. These are the productive guys that showed up that got out of the thymus into the blood. These are the guys who we only see as remnants sitting as the other allele on, on, on um, T cells. The, uh, this is the allele that's not functional. And we can see that there's some significant dis differences between their VJ usage just their VJ uses. I and mean, we haven't talked about a bunch of you know, the other properties. But you can see that some, um, some Vs and Js, which were not used very much, didn't, you know, clearly got negatively selected because they were made at pretty high levels and didn't get out of the thymus. Okay? This is to be explored since I just thought of this like three days ago, stupidly. I've been sitting with that data for like six months. Um, okay, so then just one quick comment on germline evolution. So one thing that we noticed here, what, the, what I've been telling you is that the sequences that we all share, the, the T cell receptor sequences that we all share, are these sequences with very few insertions. Okay? So the question would be, and they're playing, these are playing a clearly prominent role. Is this prominent role strictly by development, or they actually have some extra function? Well, there's a hint that they might be doing more than just being developed sort of randomly. Um, and that is that if you take a mouse and you knock out TDT, this enzyme that inserts nucleotides, you create a mouse 
that has no insertions at all. However, that, th that strain of mouse it has no immunological deficiencies that people can see. I mean, they, they've, they, there's a couple studies where they make these mice with no TDT. They confirm that they don't have any insertions. And then they hit these things with every disease they can think of. And they don't do any worse than normal mouse who have, have the TDT. So one of two things, either we just don't need a diverse repertoire. It's maybe there for random cases where some new disease shows up that we've never seen before. Or, and these particular... Um, uh, sequences, these particular low insertion um, beta chains, TD, um, T cell receptor sequences, are playing a particularly prominent role. And in fact, it's possible that they are, unlike the high insertion guys. And that is because if you don't have many insertions, your entire receptor is made up of things, of nucleotides that are encoded by the germline. So, you actually, so natural selection can actually act on on the set of receptors that, that have no insertions. So it's possible that these are truly special receptors. Um, I'm not sure if that argument didn't come across quite clear. What I'm trying to say is that, um, right, why don't we save that? If you have questions about it, we'll go, we'll go into it in a minute. But what I'm trying to, try, what, I'm just, what, what I'd like you to get out of this for now is that is we're trying to separate the question, is there something special about the particular receptors that, that have no insertions, these ones that I'm, that I'm talking about here. And so we need to get a hint about that. Um, we have to look at, we, it, it, it's, this gets into a, a standard um, problem that you find in epidemiology all the time, which is that you, you can have confounding effects, right? Which is that sequences that show up a lot also have um, higher um, higher clonotype counts. They're, 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 the number of sequences in your blood are also higher because they're made more often. So you and sequences that are made more often are more likely to respond to a, um, a pathogen because there's just more of them. And so the, you can't just look at things like how often do these low insertion sequences get into memory. So you have to do some tricky arguments. And the tricky arguments is asking, OK, we already know that they're more likely to get into memory. But once they get into memory, we don't know anything about whether they're more likely to expand super high or not. That should be determined by whether or not these things are, have a particular affinity to the, the um, pathogen at hand. And so that's a question we had to ask, which is that in general, do you have a correlation between getting between um, how big you expand in memory and whether you got into memory in the first place. And these charts have, you can see, there's no correlation here. So we actually did this. We just mapped these sequences between naive and memory, and we find there's no correlation. So that implies that, um, that there, there's nothing special about these sequences getting into memory. However, these sequences expand like crazy in memory. So the point is that I'm confusing the hell out of everybody, I'm sure. Um, but my point is, is that these sequences, there is some, some evidence that these sequences really do play a somewhat special role and that we can see that and that they're particularly designed to hit particular viruses. And maybe it would help if I give you some examples. So a, a cla an example is, is Epstein-Barr virus. So the nice thing about Epstein-Barr virus is that everybody has it. And when I say everybody has it, um, my colleague who's a clinical immunologist who does uh, transplants said he's seen you know, maybe 1,000 patients who have been typed, and every single one who was over the age of 10 had EBV. So of our seven people we checked, and everybody actually does have EBV, as expected. Um, and so what we did is we just combed the literature and said, what T cell receptor sequences have been shown to respond to EBV? And the way you do that is, experimentally, is someone takes a particular HLA molecule in a, what's called a tetramer and then sticks on there a particular epitope from the virus itself and has a way of pulling out whatever sticks to it. And so what they do is they actually find the set of T cells um, that stick to the particular um, exp you know, HLA uh, antigen combination that expressed by EBV. So these are functional um, uh, T cells that, that in those particular people are hitting the EBV um, virus. And so 
some of them have been shown to show up what's called publicly. In other words, they found the same sequences in multiple people. So we wanted to see, are we finding the same sequences? Where are they, and what is their role? So in, um, in HLA B8, which is extremely rare, um, it's a rare HLA type, um, there's this one sequence, this one um, EBV sequence combined with a particular HLA B8 that seems to show up everywhere. So do we see it in our sequences? Well, first, this is the part that, that other people haven't been able to do so far, which is, does it show up in the, in the people who don't have B8, okay? which was six out of our seven donors? Well, we find in the memory compartment, zero. We don't we find any copies of this thing. And in the, in the naives, we only found one copy at a low level. So it's never responding to this. There's no um, particular response with this T cell. Now we go down to the person that did have B8, and we found one in this person's memory compartment, but we found 42,000 copies of it. It's 1% of this, entire, this person's entire T cell repertoire is this one particular T cell that responds to EBV. Um, and then, okay, so that was sort of a... And when I say, we, could we use this as a biomarker? Well, in this case, I would say absolutely yes. I could have told you with just looking at this person's repertoire that this person had EBV. Okay, they had this particular sequence at 42,000 copies. They clearly had EBV. I could also have told you they were B8, that they had HLA B8 without HLA typing them. But now we go down over here, and we, there's more studies with HLA A2 because 50% of Caucasians have A2. It's by far the most common HLA type. So they did the same thing with HLA A2 with a different uh, epitope, also from EBV. And we looked, and we had. Um, five donors who, we, two of our five donors had, had um, HLA um, A2. The five without, we didn't find any copies of any of the, oh sorry, we, we used a study that had found 10 public T cell receptors. So these are exact amino acid sequences. We found zero of these in any of the five donors, but then we went down to the two donors who do have HLA A2 and we found five. So, I mean, this, I haven't done the statistics yet, but the, I mean, it's kind of overwhelming here um, that, that there's a signal. All right, so that kind of connects it back to this is viable as a biomarker. So then we went to do a quick study on, EB, on diabetes. We're, we have, um, we're actually funded to do a, a much bigger study now, but this was just our pilot study. We just did three cases and three match controls. Um, and we also had seven non-match controls. And we, all, we did the same thing. We sorted into naive and memory. And then we sequenced both naive and memory for all 13 donors. And just to start out with, we noticed that the, um, the average copy number of the CD4 effector cells were um, higher in the people with than the people without. And in terms of comparing sequences, we're still in the process of doing that, so I don't want to present the data yet. But we're clearly seeing se sequences that are... are uh, in, the, in the type 1 diabetes population that are in their, their memory compartment that aren't in the memory compartment of the people without type 1 diabetes. So it looks like this is a method to find viable biomarkers. Obviously, we need more than our three cases to confirm anything interesting, um, and we're doing that. So I can, next time, I'll, I'll invite myself back, Arnie. Um, next time, I'll tell you about that. Um, so just to sum up real quick is that... Um, you know, we now have this ability to sequence millions of T cell receptor sequences per sample. Um, we learned that the effective size of the repertoire is far smaller than predicted, and that this implies a huge overlap and also public T cells. Um, and just, we have a bunch of projects over, uh, underway. I told you about the, some of the um, uh, cancer projects. With We're doing a couple different immunotherapy projects, plus some um, projects related to looking for um, biomarkers. Um, and then just one other thing that might or might not be of interest to anybody if they happen to be interested in T cells or B cells, we're, we actually just spun off a company so that because it, just to open it up and we, you know, we sort of created this technology so if anybody wants to use it, it's, we just made it really easy to use. Um, and also the way we did it this way is for, for my own research, it's way cheaper to do it through the company than through the hutch, which was killing us. Um, but anyways, if, you, if you're interested, we have a website. You can just go down there and, and contact us, and we can do this for you. And then just to acknowledge a few people, um, the labs of uh, Hootie Warren, who's a clinical immunologist, and Chris Carlson, who's, who's an expert in sequencing. Um, 
it was kind of a collaboration between all three of us. A lot of the work was done by Santosh in my lab. And then we've had some Jerry knee palms, a big guy on um, uh, type 1 diabetes. And Stan Riddell is a clinical immunologist in our group. Um, and yeah, that's it. Yes. Questions? Yes. These CDR3s that you sequence. Mm -hmm. Oh, can we find the D? Yeah, so the D ranges. Um, so, so basically, the reason I didn't talk a lot about the D is that you have the, 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 the D gets always mapped into the NDN region, it's called, where the insertions and the D, because a significant fraction of the D is usually deleted. Yes, yeah, so we have all our data divided into a set of data where we can see the Ds and we know which one it is, and then a set of data where, where there's so little D left that we can't tell which of the two Ds it is. Um, about, about over three quarters we can identify which D it is. So it's mostly insertions on the start of the D region? Well, the D regions are, there's two D regions, one's 12 and one's 16 bases long. So even if you delete, they all have some deletions, so you, How many genomic two. Oh, just two, yeah, for humans. So it's pretty easy to, uh, um, usually it's pretty reasonable to identify. They really have to be down to two nucleotides or something before we have a hard time, or three nucleotides before we have a hard time. So what that. do you think, I mean, one of the reasons why we're all so impressed with the immune system is its combinatorics were enormous because it has to handle anything it has never seen before. And then the first time you take a good look at it, it's not taking advantage of its combinatorics at all. So what do you think <laughs> is going on? Or do you think that it's just, it is responding to an environment which is boring in Seattle, or? Um? <laughs> no, I mean, this is, a, so when I said, so our ethnicities, although we actually obviously took, drew the blood of everybody in Seattle, when I said African, these are people who had, been in America for, you know, really grew up in Africa, and the, oh. our Indian person really grew up in India, so it's not necessarily, but I, what do I think? I think that, that probably, um, that it's sort of there for a rainy day, which is that, that, that population-wide, we do end up having a reasonable amount of diversity. There's a lot of, there's a much larger set of commonality, and then there's, so I think basically what we call our adaptive immune system has a part that's basically innate, and that the adaptive part isn't that often used. It's used in cases where, where new things come in that we, you know, that we haven't been exposed to. I think it's probably way more efficient. I mean, you know, we get the flu every year, and we've been doing that for. What, what about the age? What about what? The ages. I mean, were the ages vary, varied a lot too? I guess you had a mother and two daughters, right? Yeah. So we didn't get. So we didn't really get the uh, the the group. We're doing a study right now um, on aging. And so basically, the, the literature says that until you're about age 50, you're, it's not, that between about age 20 and 50, there's no real noticeable difference between um, diversity in your immune system. At 50, it changes a little bit, but mostly changes between, you know, relative ratios of memory to naive. And then by age 70 or 80, not till you're actually probably close to 75, 80, does the actual number of T cells start dropping. So you're the, the reason that, that for instance, 70-year-olds have a harder time um, responding to vaccines is supposed to be because they have much less naive T cells and many more memory T cells that aren't going to respond to a new... Um, One more question here. Yeah. Oh, two more. Naive T cells are after they've been yeah, so that's a, a really interesting project. We are actually doing that in mouse this week. Um, reason mouse. It's actually not, I mean, I would have thought when I started this it would be impossible to get human thymus, but it's actually not because whenever they do, if you get open heart surgery and your thymus happens to be in the way, they just take it out. So we actually have a set of samples, thym human thymic samples that we have on the agenda to do, and that'll be done within the next few months or six months at least. So, but it, it'll be a really interesting question. 
But then you get into some other issues, which are you have to separate out which cells you think are pre and post selection. And there are dogma in the field of which are which. But you know, I think what we're learning is that the dogma isn't necessarily quite right. So we're going to get stuck at some point. So, but it's, it's going to be a really cool experiment. You have one more question here? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think, so it's probably true that, it's probably true that new, new T cells, uh, new viruses or new ex pathogens probably start out, it's probably easier to get into the immune system if you're completely masked from our, um, from the repertoire that we have or are, is common. But the, but probably, and viruses evolve so fast that they probably could stay, avoid our immune system in a lot of cases, but it's, it's not in a viral particle, for instance, interest to kill its host. So I think there's this weird interplay between how the human immune system evolves and how viruses evolve. There's a lot of cases in the innate immune system where this has been really well studied. But in the adaptive immune system, it hasn't really been well studied yet. But I would guess that, that you know, there's an evolution in the germline that, that as we get new viruses, you start to create new T cell receptors that take over the population. And the, and the viruses actually benefit from this because they can learn to live within the host as opposed to killing their host. But that's just pure guesswork. It's an interesting field that and there's lots of people in the innate immune system that are studying. Harmit Malik, if you are interested, he's, he's studying at the Hutch. He's got some really cool data on the, on the innate immune system. Okay, let me uh, wind up by thanking all of the speakers in the audience for a very, very good day. Thank you.